Yo, did he just walk up and down smash? No one has ever done that in the history of Dota! Faker, what was that? Shoutcasters. They are the delivery men of hype, the oracles of observation, and our humble guides to strategy. Sports commentary dates back all the way to 1912 in the United States, back when screens didn't even exist and people listened to play-by-play -play commentary of baseball games on their radios. Shoutcasting has come a long way since then, from the rap gods that spit 20 syllables a second to the analytical geniuses who can predict a perfect draft, there are so many talented esports shoutcasters in today's scene. But the actual skills of a shoutcaster are not ones that are really well honed when you're playing video games. Speaking quickly, metaphorical analysis, energy, and charisma, none of these things really have anything to do with your solo queue rank. Shoutcasting has a very different skill set from just being a pro player, and not many pro players actually make great shoutcasters, but many of them do get opportunities because organizations are eager to capitalize on their brands. But how do you, as a regular person, become a shoutcaster? What does it take for someone who isn't a former pro player or have the connections to one of these big companies have to do in order to get into this scene? How difficult is it? How much does it pay? What do the hours look like? And of course, how do you actually get better at something like shoutcasting? In this video, we will talk about some of the most prominent up-and-comers in the North American casting scene, along with the best casting duo that exists in North America today. We will explore the world of casting and all of its ups and downs in order to explain how you can go from a no-name caster to the best in your region. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to League of Documentary. This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is the most affordable VPN that allows you to use VPNs on multiple devices at the same time with just a single account. Whether you're trying to protect yourself and your data while you're using public internet, or just trying to find the best shows to watch in other regions, Surfshark's got you covered. No matter what platform, device, or OS system, Surfshark's available. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you try it and don't like it, you can simply cancel your subscription, get your money back, and buy yourself a cup of coffee instead. Go to surfshark.deal/dong and enter promo code DONG for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. This is the cheapest price on the market today. That's surfshark.deal/dong for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. That's promo code DONG, link in the description. Hi, I am Isaac Gazelle Cummings Bentley. My name is Dimitri Alk Battery Toledo. Uh, I'm Matt Cobby. My name is Mark Alexander Aramide. I also go by Rafa. I'm Smax or Sam if you prefer. My name is Clayton Rains. I'm better known in esports spaces as Captain Flowers. I am a caster at Riot Games, uh, working on the LCS. I've been doing that for about six years and Really, I've been full-time in esports pretty much my entire adult life. Color caster for mostly League of Legends. Uh, more recently, been doing Wild Rift. I am a League of Legends and Wild Rift caster, uh, and you may have seen me on shows like the Proving Ground Circuit or the Scouting Ground Circuit. As of this year, I started working in the Academy uh, scene as well. Last year, I won esports play-by-play -play caster of the year at the esports awards which is voted on by not just fans but also an inside industry panel okay so you want to be a shoutcaster the first thing you have to figure out as a shoutcaster is are you going to be a play-by-play -play caster or a color caster what's the difference color casters and play-by-play -play casters each have their own challenges and it's not to say one is easier than the other both require a tremendous amount of skill, dedication, and hard work in order to reach the top and be hired by Riot. Think of it like, like a picture. The play-by-play -play is drawing the lines, showing you exactly what you're looking at, while the color caster's job is to fill that in, make it really pop. A full color, and once we get to the end of the game, hopefully you've had a beautiful painting or something drawn in your mind of kind of a narrative spoke from beginning of draft all the way to after that nexus explodes. Captain Flowers is widely considered to be the best shoutcaster in North America, but he was widely unnoticed in the scene. 
until he got his first big break, which was getting to the front page of Reddit thanks to a post called Captain Flowers Goes Crazy. Guys, GP ulti lands Baron down to about a quarter of itself. Here comes the Clark. Here comes the potential cleanup. It's gonna be Clark able to find Noiden, able to find Thesis. Notorious, you're in trouble too. He's gonna melt. Half of looking for even more damage. This is gonna be the 3v5. Syndicate gets annihilated. Half of looking for the last one. That's Warrior. Oh, Warrior showing up. 250,000 views on YouTube overnight, and it was like instant explosion. And there isn't really an equivalent of that if I was a color commentator. I think that it's much more common for play-by-plays to obviously have those moments, but I wouldn't say that there aren't those like memorable moments from color casters as well, right? Like a super famous example, you know, Kobe has has a number of calls that people think of like really clearly, you know, as far as like that TP sucked and- Oh man, that TP sucked. Yeah, it's gonna give a free turret there to Quas in the top lane. Looper, they did it! it! See how they they do you believe Kobe? Did it! Are you kidding me? They're going to take down the undefeated team here at MSI. And I never on. doubted them. I never doubted them. But, I mean, as, as far as just like going viral, it's obviously, I think, just harder as, as a color caster than it probably is as a play-by-play. But also the reality is it's pretty hard as a play-by-play too, right? There's not that many people that kind of like get those those huge casting moments play by play is the guy whose your voice is going to end up in all the highlight packages you're going to be on all the reddit clips you're the one who's going to get the montage based material you can't really put dubstep music behind someone breaking down a wave freeze and just be like holy shit can you believe he pulled that off for play by play casters you're also not trying to just hit that one in a million you're not just YOLOing a 1% viral clip on Reddit. I hit a, a 1% viral clip on Reddit, but for play-by-play, -play, the way I look at it is you find luck at the crossroads of opportunity and preparation, yeah. right? That's what it's all about. So as a play-by-play, -play, you want to make sure that you're going through and you're making these games exciting. You're making sure that you're not repeating the same word every sentence. You're making sure that you're hyping up the right things and finding the right abilities and the big moments in every game. Uh -huh. And you're delivering on those high moments. You're never expecting one of those to go viral. That's never the actual play. It's just, hey, keep grinding, keep putting together that portfolio. I've got a playlist of all of my my casts that I've done. And when people ask me for a portfolio or anything like that, I'm like, hey, here's all the games that I've casted. Both are similar. It's just the play-by-play -play one does have that 1% lucky crit chance to go viral. That's the way I look at it. Play-by-play -play has the original 1% crit chance rune from the old school rune pages that can just win you the lane. But both of them do require a lot of preparation. I still think color casters way harder because you just have to know so much about the game and when you think about who could be a color caster in the landscape right now. At any time, like player can retire and kind of take up the mantle of being a color caster where I'm at, they'll probably have more knowledge to draw upon than me. So I have to have like much better skills or good enough branding as a caster behind me to like make sure that I'm still considered in, in that talent pool. That's just the reality that any at any time, one of those players could retire. They probably have 20 times the following that I do just because they competed in the league at a high enough level. As long as they know how to present themselves well on a broadcast and they know how to actually present information, if you can do that on a broadcast, any professional player, any coach, any high level analyst could be a color caster. It's just tough to get noticed. It's tough to kind of like, a, a lot of how people are building reputations is, is through like content creation. I think that's very hard because it's so oversaturated right now. At, at the end of the day, even if your stuff isn't getting like as many upvotes or whatever, you can still establish yourself as someone who really does know the game um, through like educational content and through content creation and podcasts and these various things that people are a part of that a lot of color casters do. I think that one person who's done a great job, despite being very new in the casting scene of building his own brand is Cadre. For a lot of pro players, yes, they're good at the game, but they don't know how to express themselves well or speak properly or really engage people in a conversation. But Cajal's adept at it as, as well as being a pro player, right? And that's very, 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 very rare. Cajal streams, Cajal does VOD reviews, Cajal does, here's my expectations with tier lists for worlds. Cajal's making all sorts of supplementary content so that people watching can get invested in Cajal as an analyst, can get invested in Cajal as a personal brand and say, hey, I like the way that he looks at the game. 
and I want to keep hearing his takes on the game. One of the biggest challenges for color casters is the number of opportunities that they actually get. If you're a color caster, you have to spend an insane amount of time studying up on so many different parts of the game. Whereas play-by-play -play casters just work on their mechanics, so to speak, color casters have to be constantly studying up, whether it's on matchups, player behavior, or the current solo queue trends, color casters really have to just specialize in one specific game. Play-by-play -play casters can just work on their speaking skills, their metaphorical skills, so they can much more easily be able to swap between games. Color casting and play-by-play -play casting are both difficult in their own way. To be able to reach the top and cast for a company like Riot, you're gonna have to put a ton of time into whichever one you're gonna be focusing on. And while the path to becoming a pro color caster is harder from a career perspective, you as the caster probably aren't gonna make that decision. Most casters are not casting whichever role they feel is the most career advancing, they just cast whichever one they feel better doing. One of Jat's first questions was, okay, so you're Diamond 1, you understand the game, like you've been high rated all season. A lot of times high rated players want to be color commentators more than play-by-plays because they want to explain the game and share their knowledge, but you want to be a play-by-play, -play. why is that? And then I gave him a very similar answer to what I'm giving you now, where to me, it's all about the emotion and the excitement of the game and the way that I can really convey that holy shit kind of a moment. They've got Elder Drake for another 45. Holy shit! Canyon is instantly deleted. RNG. That's the whole life of League of Legends. Those moments that make you want to jump up out of your seat and just like shake your monitor. That's what it's all about. And so that's what I always took more joy in as opposed to the analytical breakdown type stuff. And that's why I've always wanted to be more of a play by play. Now, here's the all important dirty question that everyone needs to know. How much do you make as a shoutcaster, and can you make a living? The answer is, of course you can. Professional casters like Azale and Flowers are certainly not struggling financially by any means. It's not really about whether or not you can make a living, but how successful do you have to be as a caster in order to make a living? How quickly can you get paid, and how quickly can you get paid enough so that this can be your full-time job? Casters get paid differently from every other job in the world. They don't get paid for each hour of casting they do, they don't really have salaries unless they're directly employed by Riot, and most casters don't have enough fans to survive off of donations alone. What casters get is something called a day rate. The way that rates work in, in the space is a lot of it's based on day rates. Day rates would be like two best of threes or a best of five. A typical casting day, like it's six, seven hours being there and like talking in person. The reason that we quote in day rates is because no matter what, we have to be ready to go for those six hours. You can think of it as the path of an aspiring musician. The first tier is what I like to call the street performer tier. You are an amateur caster. Most people have not heard your voice before, and most people do not want to hear your voice. You perform at places like small amateur tournaments, local charity events, and the subway because people are going to be forced to listen to you. At this stage of your career, you don't really matter. Consider yourself to be lucky that you're getting any money whatsoever. Whatever generous scraps the tournament organizers are willing to throw at you, you take it and you say thank you. You don't matter yet. All you're doing as an amateur caster at this level is you're trying to improve and you're trying to find your voice. You are looking to improve your knowledge, your mechanics, and understand your personality going into shoutcasting. At this level, the most casting jobs that will pay you are not going to be giving you more than $50 a day. And even that would be considered very generous. The second tier is like an underground artist. You've gotten a little bit of name recognition and your voice has gotten a lot better since you've started. Social media is starting to see a few followers and small orgs are offering you opportunities to work with them again. At this level, you should be looking to get at least a little bit of payment for every job you do, depending on how popular you are as a caster. Rates vary depending on the size of the event, how many sponsors the event has, and how many credits you have to your name. But these day rates can range anywhere between $100 all the way up to $500 for a single day. The types of tournaments that you're looking to cast are essentially just high-level amateur tournaments, filled with master tier and challenger solo queue players who are looking to break into the professional scene. You're essentially just performing for weddings and other small events. 
Your parents are telling you to go back to school, but you're still not really listening to them. The next step is the semi-pro step. You've been in the shoutcasting business for at least a year now, and you have something that's beginning to look like an original voice that allows you to garner a small fan base in the world of esports. Just as you're a semi-pro caster, you'll be working with semi-pro players. You're mostly going to be working for events such as the LCS Proving Grounds and the LCS Academy. The players that you'll be featuring are either new solo queue upstarts looking to break into professional play, or washed up retired pros whose teams are just recycling their contracts. The rates for these events can vary as well, but the gold standard is $750. This is what the LCS Academy pays per day, and this is the rate that pretty much everyone uses at this level. While you might not be the headlining artist that sells the tickets, you are still considered a good warm-up act for the fans to get excited. While you're not exactly rolling around in cash, you shouldn't be an artist who struggles to pay for food anymore. And finally, of course, you have the professionals, the ones that perform on the big stage, where they have hundreds of thousands of followers, and people come out just to see them. The official casters working for Riot Games make no less than $1,000 per day, and that can scale up to theoretically anything. So long as this caster is insanely popular and the money is there, they could potentially be paid tens of thousands of dollars per day if they are popular enough. So obviously, the amateur scene isn't going to pay you enough where you can make this a full-time job. But can semi-pro casters make this their career? $750 a day might sound like a lot of money, but the reality is, it's still just not quite enough. The way I make a living uh, shoutcasting is by working other jobs. Uh, and then doing this on the side. You, you cannot do this full-time and only this full-time. It's competitive and there's there's not enough tournaments in like days. That rate, I have to work with like three casting companies a week. That's like for just like the weeks where like the leagues are going. The majority of the season, there are not leagues that are going because this is not year round. October is dedicated to the worlds. None of us will work during that. And then after that, it's like the off season where no one works in November, December. Like you pick up like stuff on the side if you're lucky and you take like lower rates just because like you're not working. And then when January comes back around, that's when things get reset up. And like, you just pray that you're a part of Proving Grounds and Academy again. Okay, so let's do the math. If a standard day rate for the LCS Academy is $750, and you can only realistically get about 40 days of work per year, this means that the highest amount you can earn in a single year of casting is only around $30,000. This is of course assuming that you're able to be hired for each and every major event, along with being able to negotiate for that top $750 rate. It is at the same time, a little bit cutthroat because we're all fighting for the same jobs at the same time. Like there are a lot of color casters that are some of my closest friends and sometimes they get jobs that I want and then I don't get. I think the biggest part of casting that people tend to forget and even in esports is it's a lot of networking. It's a lot of knowing. It's all about who you know. Uh, goes across many other fields of work, but for esports especially, who you know can be sometimes more important than how good you are. The, there's been a discussion about like, hey, is there a little bit of nepotism here? But all of these people, I, in my personal belief, working with them, they are truly qualified and you know, they are, they are there for the job. Networking is a part of your job. Like the only way to really sustain doing this full time is like work of a big region. I, I'm, I'm trying to get there. That that's like the goal for everyone. The interview process started with the email from Riot that said, Hey, saw the clip on Reddit, loved it. Let's talk. That was April of 2016. I signed the contract to join the LCS in November of 2016. Jesus. So May, June, July, August, September, October, November, seven months of interviews. That, <laughs> it was, it was intense, man. You get the email and then they're like, hey, let's uh, set up a conversation and talk about this with the head producer of the LCS. A very general thing, it's a Skype call. It doesn't last very long, it's about like a 30 minute call. And then afterwards, you know, you get another email that's like, things went good. We want you to have an interview with like our people down in the, the OS slash LPL office. Cause you know, one of the things that they ask is like, you know, are you just wanting to cast in North America? Are you willing to go to other places as well? And at the time I was like, yeah, I'll go anywhere. They're like, what is your, if you were allowed to cast anywhere, where would you want to cast? And I told them North America, because you know, this is my home. This is where I live. Like ideally, if I got to pick one, 
it would be the LCS. We got through the first handful of interviews. It gets to the first Skype cast, which is they literally get Jat or Kobe and they join the Skype call and you cast a game with them. It's just, it was one of like the, the recent LCS games from a couple weeks ago or whatever. A full practice cast where I had, I, I don't know who all, maybe like Jat and Freak and, and some of the other Riot people were sitting in on kind of listening. And then I did one more thing that I think was like a, like a mini practice cast. Like they wanted me to go through like a champ select and basically talk about how I would talk about it. And you cast champ select plus the game with Jat and Kobe. And I remember that man the the nerves for that are real as somebody who's never casted with any of these these top dogs before i remember thinking when i got into the one with jat when i was going in there i was like okay there is a significant chance that everything i do is wrong so i told myself i was like no matter what my goal in this interview is to learn as much from him as humanly possible and that's what I did. Like, that's where I paid close attention to the champ select difference I was describing to you earlier, where I had bad habits from carrying champ selects, doing solo casts or duo casts with people who had never casted before. That's one of the things that Jad immediately corrected me on. He was like, okay, you're talking way too much in champ select. You don't need to explain everything that's going to happen based off of the picks. Let me do that. You set it up and I'll be able to explain it. And I was like, okay, cool, perfect. That's the first lesson that we're taking away from this thing. So I didn't actually like ever apply to cast. Uh, they came to me uh, and just said that they were basically looking for casters. So I ended up actually applying and joining the playtest team. I don't know if you know what they do, but it's basically working with the designers and everything uh, on game balance and like suggesting changes and testing out new champions and all that sort of stuff. So I was doing that for about a year at Riot. They basically talked to me and said, hey, like we'd be interested in having some casters and stuff. Um, it, was, it was fairly quick though. For me, it was just, pins and fucking needles sitting there waiting to think of, okay, are you getting the email that says, thanks, but we're going in another direction or are we still going forward with this? And then after you pass those, after you pass both of those, those VOD review sessions and everything, you get to the gauntlet. The kind of like extreme gauntlet that Flowers was talking about as far as the interview process. And, you know, I think I interviewed with 10 people or something like that. Maybe more if you count like post visit interviews uh, for my initial position, but that was for playtest. And then because I was already a full-time Riot employee, the interview process was lighter transitioning over to casting. My transition into League of Legends casting is different than maybe almost all the casters in League in the world. I had cast that, you know, BlizzCon is like the world championship. So I had casted the world championship for multiple, you know, other games. So like I had a lot of casting experience. So I do think, you know, my interview process was also somewhat different as a result. Whereas like almost everyone else, I'm probably forgetting some people, but like everyone that I know that casts professional League, League was their first game really, right? Like this was their first thing. So it was a little bit of a different scenario for me, both in that I was full-time at Riot already and that I had a lot of casting experience. Overall, I did somewhere between 20 and 25 interviews with Riot with the last like seven or eight of them being that in-person interview gauntlet. All the rest of them are Skype. Cause I feel like once they fly you out, then they're pretty like very serious about you. Well, the thing is about when they fly you out, like when they fly you out, yes, they are very serious about you because otherwise they wouldn't commit the resources to like get you the plane, get you the hotel, get you out there, like reserve time on eight different people's calendars to interview you. Like they're definitely serious about it at that point. But it's also a one thumbs down equals no process. If you get a thumbs up from seven out of eight of those interviews and the last interview is like, no, this guy's a bad fit, you don't pass. Because it's not like every person you're interviewing with is a caster, right? Yeah, you have the interview with freaking Jat, but then you have an interview with a producer. You have an interview with a coordinator. You have an interview with like someone who runs events and those sorts of things. You have an interview with somebody who handles behind the scenes type stuff. And you just have these interviews with each one of the people. And some of the questions are tough. They don't, they don't pull any punches. I remember one of them, Jat walked up to a whiteboard and he drew an axis and he said, okay, so the vertical axis is excitement and the horizontal axis is game time. I want you to graph for me the general hype level of a game five in a playoff should look like. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why they might throw like some random ass questions at you is really just like seeing how you're gonna handle a curveball. Because at the end of the day, there's so many situations where like 
the prompter breaks or we're supposed to toss to a commercial and then like you toss the commercial and nothing happens and it's still on you or there's a pause or there's a bug and you don't know what's going on and like you just have to kind of like roll with the punches a lot of the time right and so to me like that's probably what they're trying to interview for with some of the really weird questions or random random scenarios that you know they showed to flowers one of the producers was just asking me like tell me about the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you go right you know things like that which was like a little bit weird you, you tell this funny what you believe to be maybe a funny story or something and just no reaction whatsoever you'd be like okay and then just go to the next question so like, oh my god i don't know if this person hated me like loved me i got no clue but it, it's much less of like a standard interview process i think for casting than it is for you know like regular job when I was applying for playtest, it was much more like formulaic in that you're being like screened for various things. Whereas I felt like for, for esports, it was here are some like key members at Riot. And we basically just want to make sure that like all of them have a positive opinion of you and all of them think that like you could do a good job here. And it was more kind of along the lines of that. So being able to speak confidently, being able to improv, like all the same kind of skills is what they are trying to test you for. So I didn't feel like there was any sort of specific prep I had to do. So Riot has a has like a handbook and they have like, you know, the, the tenets of, of Riot as a company where it's like player experience first and always be adding value to things and shit like that, right? Like all these, like the high level points, philosophical points. And I specifically remember one of the questions that I got in the interview because I sat down in the interview room and they were like, okay, the, the guy that's interviewing you next, he's wrapping up a meeting right now. He'll be in here in four or five minutes. And so I'm sitting there and up on one of the monitors, the big monitor on the wall, they have like the four tenets that Riot has as a company. And they're like, here you go. Uh, these are our four tenets. Just like look those over before he gets in here. And so he gets in there. And I remember because he has a big chicken leg that he's eating too. He's like, okay, sorry for one. I'm eating. I've had meetings all afternoon. Uh, do you mind if I eat my chicken leg while we do this? I was like, no, that's super cool. He's like, great. He's like, you've read these four things on the wall, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, so those are the those are the four tenets of the company. You realize like that's like the four philosophical pillars, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, okay. Uh, your job right now is to remove one of them. Which one's least important? Shit. Yeah, that was, so you have to tell him which one of these fundamental pillars of the company is the least important and why. Which, which tenant did you pick though? I'm off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember. What, what uh, are the four tenants? Off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I read that guidebook, dude. It's been, I can't be at fault for this. I'm a freelancer. I don't, I'm not salaried by Riot. I don't have to know them anymore. I don't have to know them anymore. I'm a freelancer. Off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember them. I have a handbook that has them in it. <laughs> and then the fourth one was, I can't remember, honestly. I can't remember what the fourth one was. So but it was they something don't matter, like that. Basically. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they've changed over the years. It looks like there's five of them now. I think it might have been reworked. Okay, I have an excuse. I have an excuse. Because on the, on the Riot career page now, I see, like, they have a, a thing that says, like, our values, and there's five. Player experience first is the one that I always remember because that's always the one that I've heard rioters on social media, on Reddit and stuff, like always say is, you know, riots out to like, people at Riot want to make a game that is fun for players. And then I'm trying to, what the hell were the other two? Well, look, I'm just saying that me and Riot must've come to the same conclusion because the other two are gone and these two stayed. Well, I remember that I said player experience first was my number one one. So maybe, maybe I was just the prophet of and player experience first on the website is also listed first right now. I picked an important one, but yeah, that interview is just sort of, testing your your critical thinking and your ability to defend your your point of view it's not like there's a correct answer or a wrong answer in that question it's just showing that you know how to look at the situation pick what seems like the best answer and be able to explain it like your ability to just represent yourself and the whole interview process it was intense it was like i just remember the whole time being like Damn, this is crazy that I'm even here. It it felt like a dream. It really did. So every interview was a little bit different. Nobody was just all asking you the same type of stuff. The last couple of them are actually like the the top dog, top dogs. Because I thought the in-person gauntlet at Riot was the end of it. Like you pass that when you win. And I get home and they send me an email. They're like, hey, uh, good news. Everybody at Riot is on board with you. Everybody was thumbs up for your interviews. Uh, you just have one last step now. We're going to have you interview with the the global head of esports with Riot. I was like, well, that's a title. This one felt more like the earlier ones, which was more of just like a vibe check slash personality test slash bigger picture thing of just, you know, this guy who's at 
the top, really wanting to get a feel for you and what you're about and if you would be a good representative to the world of Riot Games. Like you're looking at probably around 40 people total representing League of Legends English commentary in the big four regions at the highest level. So it's, it's a very big thing that they're choosing if they're saying, okay, we want this guy to be our representative. One thing that people are going to ask you a lot is specifics. When you're interviewing with Riot, they don't want some generic interview bullshit answer about how you just think the company's a really good fit for your personal growth and you can work well together to achieve synergy. No, 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 fuck the buzzwords. I really want to diversify my portfolio with uh, greater experiences and expand my own perspectives while understanding a team environment and working towards a product that we can all recognize the huge opportunity for growth in. That answer is such farm fresh horse shit, it's still going nay, right? Like that is such a garbage answer that means literally nothing. I just said an entire paragraph and none of it has any meaning. All it is is regurgitated corporate crap and they don't wanna hear that. They wanna hear specifically what makes you, you, why are you wanting to be a part of this, of Riot, of League of Legends? Why are we the priority and not some other place like what makes you love league of legends specifically like they want to hear that if you're so excited to work with riot because holy shit dude you have been a riot fan since 2013 since watching league of legends talk about that tell me about your passion for the game tell me about what inspired you to pursue this commentary and why being here is such a big deal to you like just that honesty is a lot and it's a lot in a good way it's not how can you fit into what we currently are? But even more so, what do you bring to the table that can make us even better? And then I got the I got the thumbs up from that one. And it was the shortest call ever. It was a few minutes long. He was like, hey, just uh, just wanted to circle up with you here real quick and let you know that you passed. And we want to fly you out here and have you be a part of the LCS 2017 season we want to have you here for for spring start and your first games would be the first week of spring and i said that sounds phenomenal i can't wait and i think that this is going to make us both hit a home run and he was like hell yeah that's what i like to hear and i closed every program on my computer and i turned the switch on my speakers up to 100 and i turned the internal volume setting on the computer up to 100 and i opened up youtube and I found the Sweet Victory song from Spongebob from the Band Geeks episode. And I played that as loud as I fucking could and I just sat back in my chair. And I remember being so fucking happy. I made it. I got there and I was gonna be doing the LCS and that was just such an incredible feeling. I want to introduce the NALCS One viewers to our newest caster, Clayton, Captain Flowers Reigns, One of the main reasons that a lot of people go into shoutcasting is because they consider it to be a very fun and easy job. But even though every single shoutcaster loves their job, there are certainly ups and downs to every single profession. How stressful is shoutcasting really? I have not met like a caster who doesn't find the job incredibly stressful, at, at least at certain points during the years. I, I've seen like a number of casters during Worlds and MSI and stuff, like literally in tears, like so stressed out of their minds and from like hate they're getting from the community or, you know, they're getting roasted for saying something wrong on broadcast or whatever. And I think that really does like wear people down. For anybody out there who didn't see, who's fans of esports, I literally just announced earlier this week that I will not be doing Worlds this year. And that's, that's my decision based on personal, like physical and mental health stuff. Worlds is a month long commitment and it's usually, especially if you're based in North America, because California's time zone is just legitimately unlucky for the rest of the world. So pretty much every event you're going to be needing to do a massive schedule change. Worlds is your life for the time that Worlds is happening. It's because I know how bad it messes me up and how long it takes me to recover. And everybody works differently, right? For some people, you you get on an entirely different sleep schedule and within a couple days you've adapted, you've shaken off the jet lag and you're moving in group. Not me. Like I have really bad sleeping problems to begin with. It fucks me up, man. And so I needed to be able to step back from that this time around 
and say, okay, I got to put my own health and my own self first and not do this event. Even the most popular casters will get people shitting on them. It just happens, right? Like even Flowers, who I feel like is probably the most universally loved person, gets tons of hate, right? Like everyone gets tons of hate. I mean, I think social media in general is kind of just like a plague on society. Uh, I think it's really, it's, it's really hard for a lot of people and not allowing it to literally just completely consume your entire life and just feeling like, you know, overrun with it. Social media is absolutely a must for being a caster. I don't think, at least for being a successful caster, absolutely. Your popularity somewhat like dictates your rates. And even if you are very popular and people kind of like generically know that, it's like hard to measure it without, you know, so seeing social media and seeing how people are doing there. So I know a lot of, a lot of European casters would always, when they are casting TSM or like the most popular team, and sometimes, you know, any casters would feel this with Fnatic or G2 or whatever, would feel like so much pressure about like what they're gonna say. They wanna talk to me and be like, okay, well, like, what should I say? Like, if they do really bad, like, should I say they're doing bad? You know, or like, cause they're they're kind of like worried about the fan bases and some of the teams that do have like the most vocal and, and uh, largest fan bases are really gonna get on you if they don't like what you're saying or don't, or think that you don't know what they're talking about with their team. So that's something that I know stresses a lot of people out too. Like Reddit is really hard for a lot of people because there's a lot of really opinionated people, you know, that obviously will, will, you know, tell you if they think you suck. They'll tell you if you think you're great. One of the most important parts of shoutcasting is maintaining your voice. Social media can be the biggest mental stress contributor, but when it comes to physical distress, overusing your voice can be one of the most dangerous hazards to a shoutcaster. So I had a lot of trouble with that at the start. That was a big issue of mine. It's going to be more common in play-by-play -play casters than color commentators because play-by-plays are the ones like doing all the like the super hyped up yelling and stuff when something goes crazy, right? The one that everybody reposts all the time. It's the base race. Who's going to win? The shy will not. And KT takes it to game four. If you look at the caster cam, it looks like I'm about to pass out right at the very end because I was. That game was so extreme. I finished out that series, but you could tell my voice was shot in game four and five. Yeah, there's a level two turret dive that sticks out oh. in my mind, but we won't see that this time around. No cane play. Instead, we'll be back on that Camille that he's known for. And I remember after I got out of there, I didn't really talk for like four days afterwards. I would, uh, I would shake my head up and down when people asked me questions. And I remember even in the story meetings, if I tried to, to raise my hand and say something, one of our producers would just look at me and be like, ah, ah, don't talk. After you wake up for the second day in a row and your throat still feels like shit, you're like, holy fuck, did I actually really hurt something here? And what you got to do is you should definitely be drinking like hot tea, hot honey water, anything like that during the cast. As soon as you start to feel even like the slightest discomfort in your throat, be having one of those, be drinking one of those at all times on the desk. One thing that helped me a ton was vocal coaching lessons for a few months. Like legitimate vocal training. Don't just go watch some YouTube video or some shit. And this is one of, I think, the like most misunderstood things for a lot of casters. Like is, is most casters who are newer equate volume with excitement, right? It's like the louder I am, the the like more exciting this sounds or like the the more hype this moment seems. Right, but Udyr takes her down. Udyr is taking down the Lilia. Well, in the back, Trindamir is trying to take down the Nor and the Kled by himself. But down goes Lilia. Four or five people still alive on the side of the blue squad, but four people going down on red. I kind of lost myself in the middle of the fight because people started going in different directions, Flowers, but that's why we've got to get good at playing games cross-eyed. And I think that's really like not true. Like There's a lot of ways to convey excitement and emotion, whether it's disappointment or whatever, without just being like super loud. So um, just kind of using your voice intentionally and... and just drinking a ton, a ton of water for sure. If you're casting for six hours a day, five days in a row, you're going to fuck up your voice. Do not overindulge in doing nine quadrillion projects just because you want to build your portfolio or whatever. If you fuck up your voice, remember that that is literally the most important item that you have in this industry. What's the most important thing to shoutcasting? I'd say the, the most important thing to being a shoutcaster is just passion. I think the single most important thing to being a shoutcaster is 
you've got to love it. The most important thing for, for shot casting is just passion. I, I don't want to listen to a caster personally that doesn't care about the game. Because if you're not passionate about it, the audience is going to pick up on it right away. It's really difficult to fake enthusiasm or fake being excited about things. Just care. Uh, whether it's about the players, especially about the players, they're doing about as much work as you are going into scrims. You're, you're passionate. It's not just for you. It's for everyone involved, really. So I asked this question to pretty much every single one of the other casters, and they all pretty much gave me the exact same answer. Would you care to guess what it is? Prep, I assume, right? Passion. Passion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I don't know. That that to me is kind of is kind of funny. I think the most important thing going into a cast being passion is is to me that's that's saying what you think people want to hear more than what the reality is. Um, I think it's important to be passionate about your job and being passionate about casting keeps you from burning out at casting, but passion does not inherently make you a good caster, right? I think that there are so many casters that are passionate about what they're doing and people are passionate about esports and passionate about gaming. It doesn't make them a pro gamer. It doesn't make them, you know, the next uh, next big caster. Most of it is just that, hey, like these people spent their entire life playing video games and then spent an enormous amount of time watching League and then spent thousands and thousands of hours casting and hey, they're pretty good now. Having interesting stuff to talk about just helps so much like where you've already pre-planned some of the things you want to talk about the the quality of your practice is going to be more important than how many hours you practice it's super important to to be able to record yourself what are the things that you're doing that you actually think are good and the other things that you know could be better yeah so it's not passion it's definitely it's definitely not passion <laughs> <laughs> what was flowers answer not all feedback is valuable there's definitely, I'm not saying if somebody says something negative about you, ignore it. Absolutely not. You should definitely read through things, but being able to understand what's said in good faith and what's not, even if it's negative is super important. You will never be able to please a hundred percent of people. Faker is considered to be the greatest player of all time for League of Legends, but who would be considered to be the greatest caster of all time? And if you wanted to become the greatest caster of all time, how would you do that? I mean, Captain Flowers was, is obviously like so fucking talented. I mean, there's there's no other play-by-play -play that is as rapid while maintaining eloquence and clarity in his calls as 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 Clayton. Like Clayton is just so fucking good. Uh, Clayton is is like a once in a generation talent as far as just like charismatic, exciting casting, right? And like that is how he really shines. Like he is truly an incredible play by play and he brings so much hype and so much emotion into it. I was in a call with Captain Flowers like, and, and he said this and he's 100% right. He's like, I, I get flattered when people tell me they want to be the next Captain Flowers, but there's only going to be one Captain Flowers and you're never going to be better than me at being Captain Flowers. So you got to be you. And that's that's true. Like. You have to figure out something that works for you and plays to your strengths. As if you are trying to be the next big play-by-play -play caster and you're modeling everything that you are uh, after like Freak, for instance, then why would they hire you and not Freak? Just be yourself. It's super corny, it's super cheesy, and it's very copy-paste for a lot of people. That's actually questions that I got during my interview process is they would ask like, uh, so who's the caster that you try to emulate the most? I would tell them, I don't. You know, you look at traditional football commentary in like Spain or something, you see the announcer, you go, goal! And it's just, it's a big exclamatory thing that's not necessarily keeping up with every pass back and forth on the ball, back and forth between the players going down the field. No, it's just goal right there at the end, like as, as he gets that. And so you don't have to do the rap god style. Like that's not a mandatory requirement of a play-by-play. -play. It is where the meta has led itself towards and it does create really exciting moments. And if you can't do it, you need to be able to make up for that in other ways. Define yourself, brand yourself, be who you wanna be. I'm Captain Flowers. I'm the big, loud, huge chin American guy who speaks a thousand miles a minute and just goes in on games and I love Skarner.